first of all, good morning to everybody. Thanks for coming. We're uh, super happy to welcome you here at FutureM. And of course, it's my pleasure to be here speaking uh, in front of you. My name is Scott Noonan. I have been involved in the uh, software business now for 30 plus years. The last 15 or so of those have been in the web, digital, and content management space. And for the last 12 years, since 2001, I've been the CTO of a company here in Boston called Boston Interactive. It's been my pleasure to work for them. And as a digital agency, as a full-service digital agency, one of the challenges and one of the tasks that we find ourselves often uh, involved in is, is that of a good user experience for our end users who are visiting our digital sites, mobile apps, etc. But along with that, we also take great pride and put a lot of work into the systems that we create for the administrative users, the content producers, the people that need to manage all of this information. Because really, it's equally as important for them to have systems that are easy to use and systems that allow them to be able to publish their content in an effective manner. And that's really what we want to talk about today. Today we want to talk about content production, how we can make it better, the future of content production, how we can think about creating our content to publish it to multiple channels, those we're aware of today and those that we're not even aware of yet. So when we think about content production today, you know, typically we think about the medium in which we're pr producing our content. So if we're going to create a PDF, if we're going to create a web page, if we're going to create something that's going to go on a digital sign, we think about that. We think in terms of that context. So, you know, typical examples, as I said, are, are things like print or print documents, uh, PDFs, hard copy things, fold outs, things of that nature. We think about mobile apps, mobile websites. We think about kiosks and other types of displays. We think about aggregators. You know, who's going to be consuming our information and, and how do we write our content for that? Some of you involved in digital signage digital billboards, large-scale applications. Television is becoming more of a prevailing medium now for creating uh, digital assets, of course, whether it's advertising or content. We're seeing a lot of content being served through television now. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't remember our old friend, the old-fashioned website. So the results of all of this is that we find ourselves creating content for all of these different mediums. And that poses a specific challenge to us. It poses a challenge of versioning. It poses a challenge of consistency. How do we keep this message consistent across all of these different mediums and all of these different channels? For those of you who produce content, and if I could really quick get a show of hands, how many people here are in that world, the content production marketing world? Great, OK. And real quick, how many are sort of in the UX design world? Good. And any developers or people from the development side of the house? OK, very few. OK, you guys are going to hate me because I'm going to give you a lot of work to do. Okay? UX and design folks, you're going to hate me at first. You're going to love me later because you're going to realize I'm giving you all the control. And content producers, I'm going to be a rock star. So that problem that you guys have, right? you know this problem. You're creating content. You're trying to figure out, OK, I've got a new article. I've got a new press release. I've got to get it over to PR Wire. I've got to get it onto my website. I've got to get it onto my mobile app. I've got to create some hard documents for this. I've got to do all these things. I've got to manage this in all these places. And that's really a problem, right? You know that problem. You know that pain. Developers and designers, the same thing. You've got to create all these different assets to, to, to go with all these different types of content. And that's only where we are today, OK? So what about tomorrow? You know, what does tomorrow look like? What types of things are we going to have to create for tomorrow? With that, let's take a quick look at what the future could look like. For those of you who don't recognize, of course, that's a, a clip from the movie Iron Man. Really cool interfaces, right? I look at something like that and I think, wow, wouldn't that be awesome to be able to work with my interfaces like that, work with my content like that, be able to consume information and move things around. But when we look at that, we kind of think, well, you know, that's, that's great, great, and it's cool, 
great for the movies, but really, eh, it's, it's not a reality yet. I don't have to think about that. Well, I'm here to tell you today that it's not. We're there. We're not, we're, we're, we may not be there today, but we will be there tomorrow. We'll be there by the end of the year. I'm going to show you another clip here. This one is produced by Corning, Corning Glass. And this is going to show you some of the things that they're currently working on and that are ready for production today in terms of interfaces and in terms of how people are going to be working and obtaining your information very, very soon. This is Amy's room. She's not quite awake yet. And this is her tablet. These will be as commonplace as the mobile phone is today. Uh-oh. Looks like her alarm's about to go off. Amy's tablet captures, organizes, and displays all her favorite things. It also helps her at school and manages her schedule. It's encased entirely in an incredibly thin, lightweight, highly durable glass with specialized optics. Her bedroom window. It's electrochromic. It changes state from opaque to transparent on demand. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed, but this closet door is actually a display driven by Amy's tablet. All the intelligence that you see on this display, all these apps, they're all residing and running on Amy's tablet. This display spans the entire door. It has its own small footprint operating system and is smart enough to be aware of Amy's device. And based upon proximity and other rules, it knows what to display and in what format. To make this part of Amy's day a reality, Corning is helping to deliver large-scale edge-to-edge -edge displays. Corning looks to partners for operating systems and apps that seamlessly scale and transfer between tablets and larger displays. Beautiful, isn't it? All that logic encased in low-profile, thin, resilient, touch-sensitive glass. I know what you're thinking. Why would one want an old glass room? Well, for starters, these walls could be active displays and configured for different situations, depending on the required purpose of the room. Here, Dan is in a video conference and the entire glass wall has become the display. Edge to edge, seamless and touch sensitive. It's as if the remote location were now part of his room, making it easier to share and collaborate. Now that's breaking down barriers. This is really going to change the way we work. So how cool is that? Right? Pretty cool. And we have this now. Okay, this exists today. We can do this on curved glass, we can do it on dashboards of cars, we can do it on tables, walls, anything you think of as a surface, we can do this. And what this means is it means that the way we're used to consuming our content and getting our information is changing, it's changing very, very, very fast. And we can't be thinking about individual pieces and individual mediums anymore. Not only is how we're consuming our content changing, but how we're interacting with our content and our information. How we interact with our interfaces is changing as well. You know, we have things now like a gesture display or gesture, uh, uh, gesture motion interaction with interfaces, right? Move our hands around, things can happen. We, of course, have uh, audio interfaces. We talk to things, we get information back. As we all know, we have Siri. Sometimes it doesn't work quite how we want it, right? But it's coming and it's getting stronger and stronger. We have visual. We can control interfaces with our eyes. My phone, Samsung Galaxy, it sucks but I can control it with my eyes. It doesn't work yet, right? It's terrible. But because it's being worked on now, it's going to be here, and it's going to get better and better. We have the mind, right? Control with your, control with your mind. Move the cursor, choose letters. All this stuff is here. You know, in the, in the old days, those of you who can remember pre-mice, we worked with the keyboard, right? We type up and down arrows. Mouse came along, that, that's really cool, right? Change the way we did our interfaces when the mouse came. Change the way we organized our content, because we could sort of move, we could drag and drop. Along came the iPhone, swipe, tap, finger, surface, touch, all that. Changed it again. How are these going to change it? 
And what does that mean to you? You think, well, okay, great. People are going to work with my stuff differently, but why do I care? Well, because as the interfaces change and as we react and, and work with interfaces differently, people are going to grab your content differently. They're going to control your content more. They're going to be able to decide for themselves how your content looks, how your content displays. So, you know, when we think about that, we have to think in terms of interface and content. When we're dealing with interfaces, we design our interfaces. When we're dealing with content, we write our content. We have to stop thinking about designing our content. So how do we prepare for this? Okay. The good news is we kind of already have the things that we need right now. We have the systems to do it. We just have to change the way we use those systems. And we have to change the way that we think about producing our content our wonderful friend, the CMS, Content Management System, right? Today when we think about Content Management System, we think about three sort of major roles. We author content, we publish content, we manage content. What that's done is that sort of put us in a position where we think about our content in terms of pages. It's pigeonholed us. We think, okay, I'm going to create a web page. I'm going to create information on my page. When we think about a page, what do we think about? We think about layout and we think about design. We think about content or we, we talk ourselves into the fact that we're thinking about content, but in reality, we're still thinking about layout and we're thinking about design. Our good friend here, the WYSIWYG editor, stands for what you see is what you get. We loved it when it came out, right? Comfortable, word-like interface. All the content producers thought it was fantastic. I could see what my, context, my content is going to look like in its proper context. I can design my content. Right? Designers, UX people, hate the WYSIWYG. Right? You all hate it because it screws up your design. People get in there, do their own things. Developers, we now hate the WYSIWYG. Why? Because when we're trying to take this content now that you so elegantly, clearly this isn't elegant, I did this myself, that you so elegantly designed, what if I have to reformat that for a mobile, for example? I can't. It's filled with junk now. It's filled with markup, it's filled up with meta tags, filled with all kinds of things that I can't control anymore. Right? We have to stop thinking about designing our content. We have to stop thinking about our content in terms of pages. Think of this in your mind. The web page is dead, my friends. It is dead. But content is still alive and will always be alive. This is what today's CMS system looks like. On the left, we have our CMS. On the right, we have our old-fashioned website. And in the middle, we have this little guy here called the API. What does the API do, and why do we care? API, for those of you who don't know, stands for Application Program Interface. Hang on. A language and message format used by an application program to communicate with the operating system or some other control program, such as a database management system or communications protocol. APIs are implemented by, implemented by writing function calls to the program, which provide the linkage to the required subroutine for execution. Thus, an API implies that a driver or program module is available in the computer to perform the operation or that software must be linked into the existing program to perform the task. Raise your hand if you know what the hell that means. You guys are better than I am. I read that, I have no idea what that means. The good news is you don't need to know either, okay? Here's my definition. It's a magic box. You ask it for something, it gives you something back. That's all it is. So why do we care about this thing called the API that floats out there? Well, here's today's system. How does it work? Our friend here on the right, the website, says, hey, API, give me a web page. Give me the content, all the information. API goes over to CMS, gets it, says, here you go. Here's your web page. It's a fine system. It works. So why can't we take this and do something different? If you're familiar with the movie Apollo 13, there's a great scene in there where their astronauts are tumbling through space, their, their ship is, is, is maimed and limping along, and they're talking about using the lunar module to bring them home. Now the lunar module had one job and one job only, land astronauts on the moon. It was built for nothing else other than that. And as they're debating about what the LEM can do and can't do, Gene Kranz, the director, says, I don't care what the LEM was designed to do. I care about what it can do. That's how we need to think of our CMS. 
I don't care what it's designed to do. What can it do? What can this CMS and API do for us to solve our problem of production to all these channels today? Why can't we use the same CMS and modify our API? The good news is you don't have to worry about that. Our smart developers over here can do that. They love that stuff. Modify our API to not only let our website get our content, but what if we want to send our content to print? What if we want to send our content to other websites, third-party people that want to consume our content? Mobile, news aggregators, other outlets. If we extend our API, modify how we use our CMS, which we'll talk to in a moment, we can use this same system now to publish our content and prepare our content to go anywhere. Any of these guys on the right, all they have to do is ask the API. Give me the information. We'll take care of formatting it. We'll take care of the interface. Just give me the information. National Public Radio, kind of the poster child for this model. Several years ago, they had a problem that many of you have today. They were creating tons and tons and tons of content, as you can imagine. And they had a lot of different outlets and channels that needed to consume this content. They had their own mobile app, mobile site. They had affiliate stations all over the country who wanted to take their content, wrap it in their own look and feel, and integrate it within their own content. They had public mashups like NPR Addict and NPR Backstory. Same thing. Want to get all that content that's being produced, bring it into their systems. Interestingly enough, they had a tremendous amount of uh, interest from third-party app developers. People had nothing to do with NPR but wanted to get their content within, the, within their apps. And then, of course, they had their own old-fashioned website. So they had this problem. And what they did is they came up with a system called COPE. And COPE stands for Create Once, Publish Everywhere. And the concept behind this system was create my content one time in one place and prepare it to be published anywhere. So how can we learn from what NPR did and make this work for us? We do it with something called content modeling. It's a word that's been around for quite a long time. Some of you may be familiar with it. I'm going to talk about it in sort of the context that, we're, that, that I'm proposing today. And basically there are three major steps to content modeling to prepare your content for multi-channel publication. Step number one, and we'll talk about these individually after we go through the list. Step number one is we organize our content by like items or what we like to call content types. Step number two, break the content within these types into manageable pieces, a term called chunks, which Karen McGrain, a wonderful, wonderful strategist and user experience architect, has coined over the years. And it's a great term. And our third step is creating multiple versions of each chunk as appropriate. So let's talk about these one at a time. Organizing content into content types. We do this a little bit already now. Whether we know it or not, you know, we do it sort of uh, philosophically in our minds. We don't always do it technically as well as we could, but we do it. Uh, you know, we think of our content, we look at everything before us, and we, we naturally put contents into categories. We have you know, things like articles, you know, we have things like uh, biographies, right? We have things like events, products. We naturally do this. We think we have press releases. Let's put all our press releases here. What I'm proposing we do, though, is we go a little bit deeper than this. We take every piece of content and we put it into something. Because we tend to do this with some of our content, but not all of it. The rest, where does it go? Pages. It's another page can't be another page. Let's make it something real. Let's make it something tangible. Call it whatever you like. But when you're creating these content types, and this takes a, a bit of work, when you're creating these content types, what you're looking for is information that contains the same or similar type of information over and over again. Okay? Let's organize it that way. And then while we're doing this, let's look at the content within each piece very carefully. In the data world, you geeks will know this word, normalization is the term we use. What that means is, say I have an article. That article probably has an author. That author probably has some information about him or her. That content should not live within the context of the article. Break it out into its own content type. That's an author content type. Why? 
Because what if I have that author's name in 27 articles? And now that author gets married, changes their name. I don't want to go back and change it in 27 places. I want to change it in one place. The author. When we break this content up into content types, then again, we let the developers, we let the interface designers create relationships between this content. Right? Authors have bio, uh, uh, articles have authors. Authors have bios. Events have locations. What do locations have? Well, maybe parking information. Right? So instead of putting the, the location in the event, create a location content type. Then let the developers and the UX people marry those, those content types together, create a relation between them. This gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of ability to, to, to repurpose our content in different ways. That's your first step, content types. Everything has to have a content type. Step number two, break our content into chunks. So what do we mean by this? Well, this is how we're used to writing articles today or writing content today, right? We dump it all into some word processor or some WYSIWYG editor or something. Shove it all in there, back the truck up, dump it all in. And that's fine, we're comfortable with it, we're used to it. The problem we have here now is we have no way to differentiate different parts of this content. It's all together in one place. Let's take a look at an article. It's pretty obvious when you look at something like this. If I asked you, break this article up into pieces for me, redundant pieces that every article will have. It's pretty obvious. Everything has a title. Every article that we write has a title. It may have a source, right? Byline, date, publication date, image, caption, story highlights, video, main copy. Okay? It's very important that we do this. It's very important that philosophically we do this. And we'll talk about structurally how we do this within our CMS in a moment. But it's very important we break this content up into these pieces. And we think about our content in terms of these pieces. And why is that? Well, it creates not only a system that provides us with clean pieces of content that we can send anywhere and can be organized by the interface designers however they want, it also allows us to do things like put a listing page somewhere with just a list of titles on our con of, of the last five articles that come up. Search by author. Right? How would we do that if all that was just sitting in the middle of one big WYSIWYG area or one big text area, all the information dumped in there? How would we do that? It allows us to be consistent. So as content authors, you shouldn't have to worry about what that looks like on the website or anywhere else. You should worry about the meaning of your content. What, what's the best title to put in here? What's the best buy? What's the best leader text I can put in there? That's what you should be worrying about, your meaning, not what your meaning looks like, right? The interface people can do that. That's their job. If you're breaking this up into these pieces, you're maintaining that consistency. You're giving guidelines to your authors as to how they should put this information together. So we take an example. We have this wonderful sort of fake, magical new CMS that I've got here. And again, some of us do this already. This is how our content should look. It shouldn't look like a WYSIWYG editor anymore. We should be breaking this up into pieces. Make it easy. And then don't just think about what's going to show up on your old-fashioned website. Because remember, we're building a system that can manage your content to go anywhere. So be a little creative here. Here's a great place to be able to manage all your information. So maybe your article has a, uh, an audio version of it. Right? Is it going to go on your website? No, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But if you can create an audio version, store it here. Maybe it'll be used somewhere else. Maybe it'll be used on a podcasting mobile app somewhere. If you have a video, video caption, or a video transcript, Maybe you're not going to use it in one place, but it might be used somewhere else. Think about all the content that could go with, all the information that could go with that particular piece of content and store it here. Let your, let your developers create your CMS to allow you to store it here. Because now you can use that information anywhere rather than 10 separate places. You notice back here we have our author, the byline. It's, it's a select list. It's not a regular text field. This is what we talked about before with relating content together. If I create an author content type, I can put all my author information in here. 
Now when I'm here, I just choose my author. Now that relationship is built. So down the road, if one of your interface designers wants to build a system that allows you to search articles by author, you can do that. You can't do that if it's all dumped into one big area. If they want to search authors, articles of authors by certain areas ex of expertise, we can do that. Right? Clean, segmented, chunked content. Okay? Clean, not dirty. Think about making a salad, right? You as content producers, you produce the ingredients. You produce the broccoli, you produce the lettuce, you produce the tomatoes, you produce all that. Let the interface people put the salad together. They can decide what goes best. You as the ingredient producer can have all the ingredients for a salad. And maybe they won't get used in every single salad that's made. But you give the interface designer, the chef, the ability to choose what's right to go into that particular salad for display. And that's how we want to think of our content. Clean ingredients, clean pieces. Step three. This is probably the one I get the most pushback on and the most groans. Creating multiple versions of each chunk. So, you know, what do we mean by that? So, if we think of something like a title. Why can't we create multiple versions of that title? Oh, it's too much work. I have too much to do already now. I'm, I'm too busy writing all kinds of content. Now you're going to ask me to create multiple versions of content? Well, you're doing it already. Chances are. Chances are you're creating different versions of this for your different mediums out there anyway. Put it all in one place. You don't have to go crazy. Maybe three versions of something is fine. Long, medium, and short. Why? I mean, why should I have to do this? Well. You now let the interface decide which one is the most appropriate. Perhaps I have a little call out, right? Last five articles. My real estate is tight. I can use a short title. I don't want to use a long title, right? We've all been through that. Oh, it wraps. It looks ugly now. Oh, this isn't going to fit. I've got to go change my content to make it fit. And when we change content, we, we start to change meaning across the entire spectrum of your content. This way, you as a content author still can control your meaning. Don't let someone else decide, because I'm going to show you later. They will. Interface designers will decide what to do with this if you don't give them options. We do it all the time. And we're not always good with it. Great example is images. Right? Why not multiple versions of an image for your article? Why not a high res for print? Why not a low res for mobile? Why not a medium res for a website or things that can handle that? Why not different crops of that image? We all do it with our logos right now, right? We have vertical logos, we have horizontal logos, we have multiple versions of our logo. Why do we do that? Interface designers, we do it because we want to make it fit in the right context. A business card might be different than a letterhead, might be different from our website, might be different from you name it. So we create versions of it. Well, we should do the same thing with our regular imagery, right? Maybe a vertical image works better, so a horizontal wor image works better here than a vertical image, but if you, as the content producer, produce those different images, you control the image. If you don't, you leave it up to guys like me who are going to write the code to cut it the way we want to cut it. And it ain't always pretty when we do that. Seems like more work, but in reality, it's far less. It's far easier. When we create systems like this, people are grateful in the end because it's one place now they go. They don't log into their blog to do one thing, their web CMS to do another, open up Illustrator to create a print piece, do it all here. Let the developers build the, IP, the APIs and the systems. Let the interface designers decide what it's going to look like. They know what they're doing. They can make it look wonderful. You know what you're doing when it comes to writing content. Make your content wonderful. A lot of organizations are doing this already, and they're doing a very good job. CNN. If you take a look at the, uh, this is the main CNN landing page. Uh, we took a take a look at the featured article, Juror, Colin, Zimmerman got away with murder. This is the actual article page itself. Notice the title. Zimmerman, Juror to ABC, Colin. He got away with murder. Mobile app, same story. Zimmerman, Juror, Colin, he got away with murder. Three separate versions of the same title. They controlled it. They didn't let somebody else control what that title would look like. 
and they even changed it. It looks different, right? Here it's above the, above the image, above the video. We've got byline underneath that. Well, here, let's put it on top of the, the, the thumbnail for the image. Notice the image resolution itself. You can't quite see it on this screen because it's a little bit distorted, but that's a 16.9 resolution. It's widescreen, okay, for that video. That's a 4.3 resolution, non-widescreen. Two versions of the same video, okay? Why have one that looks, has the black edges on here and one that's going to look distorted on here? No, create two versions of it. Why not? We do it now for television, right? You go into your on-demand, you see HD version, regular version. If you don't have HD, you can watch the regular. Fits on your screen better. The fact is they're doing these things now. I mean, story highlights down here on the left-hand side. It's hard to see from there, but you see four, bullet story, four bulleted story highlights. Here, all of a sudden, it's the top two, and it's above the information in the article. The interface designers were able to, design, to decide what to do with that content, because that content was clean, that content was structured, and they can decide where it best fits in this particular medium. If this were just one big honking WYSIWYG editor, good luck, right? How, we, how do we do that? How do we go through all of that? How do we take the completely done salad now and pull the ingredients out and make another one? It's messy, right? We go right to the ingredients, so pick what we want, make it work. We looked at organizations who are doing this now. And I said before, if you don't do it yourself, someone's going to do it for you. And I'm going to show you how. This came into my Google Reader a couple of months ago. I've saved it ever since, and I love it. Look at that title. Air Force Secretary Steps Down, that led nuclear upgrades, oversaw contract, and sex. Okay? So what happened here? This interface, this screen reader decided we can only fit so many characters here. When we get there, boom, gone. The dreaded ellipsis comes in. That's OK. People know what that means. Well, this poor bugger now, <laughs> that changes the entire meaning of that sentence, right? That makes, that's horrible. Sometimes it makes no sense. In this case, it's just a complete different change of meaning. Now, to their credit, it certainly made me read the article, right? But if you don't give these guys an opportunity to, to, do, to give them some options of what to use, they're going to choose it. They're going to make the decision. I, as a content producer, don't want that because now my content has been, this meaning has been changed. I've lost control. Another article here from CNN, Change of Scene in Europe Cities. We have a lot of uh, different tools out there now that we can use and utilize to capture and save content. Some of you might be familiar with Instapaper. Yes, no? OK. Instapaper is a service you can sign up for. Install a little plug-in on your, on your browser. And as you're surfing the web and you see an article, hey, I really like that article. I want to read that later on. Press the button. Saves the article. You can go in and categorize the articles the way you want. Move them around. Basically a good place to sort of file cabinet all these things you find on the web. Well, that's what Instapaper did to that article. Goodbye formatting. Everything out. You're here to read. So all the time if someone took, I mean, boy, we've all heard this discussion before. I've been in meetings where literally we spent two hours talking about topography. What topography are we going to use for this blurb here on this home page? Super important. It's important to the interface designer. It's not important to the content writer. Let the interface designer decide what they're going to use. Because as you can see here, if someone spent all this time worrying about it over here and I saved it to my, inter to my Instapaper, it's gone anyway, right? I can go into Instapaper and change what fonts I want to read things and what sizes I want to read them in. So all that work that you did designing your content is going away anyway. So give me clean content. Clean content on the left, the interface designer can make it look his way. Clean content on the right allows me to consume and take in that article nice and easy. Now, I can't imagine the amount of time that the folks and the developers at Instapaper have to go through to constantly be scrubbing and cleaning that content out. It must be a tremendous effort because they're going to that web page and stripping out all the HTML and all the junk and figuring everything out, and they make mistakes sometimes. So you see that. You get, not in this particular one, but I've seen it in articles before where, you notice the story highlights are gone now, right? Those are gone. Maybe that's important. Well, they decided it wasn't. They took it away. 
It's a lot of work to do that. Like the rest of you, I like to Google cat videos, right? Google's remarkable for going through and deciding what part of our content to show. Now we have a little control over this, right? We can control our metadata. We can control our title and our description. And if we segregate and chunk out our content, like we talked about before, we can let our developers and our interface designers take that content and put it in those places so that Google can read it properly. Because if you don't, again, read through this. Look at the second one. Look, what's the description of that article? You need an Adobe Flash Player to watch this video downloaded from Apple Supercats. It's not descriptive at all. They didn't take their content and use it in a good way and let the interface designers make it part of that metadata that Google then reads. So what does Google do? It can decide for itself. Take what it wants, chop it up. Okay? Control your content. Facebook, Twitter, all the sharing, social media now, same thing, right? We all do it. See something kind of cool, want to share it? Facebook gives us an option. They have what's called the open graph tags. We can put whatever we want in there. If we put the right things in there, we get something really nice like this. This wonderful woman won $40 million. Lottery win. 51-year-old grandmother from Toronto dances with joy after winning $40 million in the lottery. Clean, meaningful content. Nice picture of her on the left. Looks like she's holding one of those big monster checks, right, that we all would love to have someday. Content is segregated. It's chunked out. Your developers, your interface designers can put it in the proper place so that Facebook will consume it and show it properly. Don't do that with your content. You get this. Image on the left. Facebook says, I'll just find the first image I can find. And because it's a square image, I'm going to shove it in there and cut it off at the left and the right. Title, OK. We look at the bottom, the dreaded ellipsis again. Allie Raisman safe, blah, 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 blah. Earning what? What a cheer. Maybe you forced me to click now to find out. Maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe that's sort of provocative. I want to find out. But the point is, you didn't get to make that choice. They made that choice. So what are we saying here? We're saying that you as content producers, stop designing. Start breaking your content up. You as developers, modify our CMSs. They can all do it, and they do a good job of it. Modify our CMSs so that the interface for our administrative users, our content producers, is structured. Let them put the information in there, not worry about the design or the layout of the, of the information. Interface designers for all the mediums we have now and all those cool things we saw coming up for glass walls, for all that, they can take that clean content and do something with it. And once again, developers create APIs that allow us to go in and ask, not for the web page, Ask for the content. Ask for the bits and pieces. So when I go as a third party medium or whatever medium that's going to be, and I ask that API for something, I just want the clean content. Give me the salad ingredients. I can take those now and I can make them meaningful and I can do something with them. And it get, that gives everybody the control that they need. Because now I don't care what that interface looks like. I don't care if it's a wall, I don't care if it's a car, I don't care if it's a sphere, if it's a bendable, it doesn't matter. I'm getting clean content. I can design to that interface. As a content producer, it's OK, because you don't have to go, oh, crap, we have this spherical device now. How do I write content for that? You don't. You write content that's meaningful. You protect your meaning. Let me show you one more video here. I think videos are cool how Microsoft sees the next five years. This is what they're working on. Again, notice the content. Notice the interfaces. The control of the interfaces.
Notice the cut and paste part in there? It's always my favorite part. How many of you cut and paste something, put it to something else, and you go, oh, right. Word to PowerPoint, Word to web, PDF to whatever, cut and paste, ugh. I gotta reformat it, do it all over again. Why? You got dirty content. Because all those applications put in all their special things in there, right? Drives me crazy. I use Notepad all day long, and I shouldn't have to. Cut and paste it, put it in the Notepad, put it into something else, reformat it, yada, 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 yada. If you use your CMS to create clean content, that problem goes away. In this particular situation, albeit it's, a, it's, it's not real right now, if you cut and paste that content from one place to another, it should be able to absorb that interface, work properly in that inter interface. But that can't happen if we give her dirty content. If we give her content with all kinds of markup and stylings around it, now something in the middle has to do a lot of work. And I don't believe in points of failure. I know because I spend my day worrying and writing code to deal with points of failure. And if I got to clean all that code up, I'm going to miss something. Stuff's going to change. Markup changes, HTML changes, it all changes. I'm going to miss something. Right? So before I go to some questions here, I sort of want to wrap this whole thing up and encapsulize it for you. Content types. Break your content down to similar types. Break that content up into pieces. Let your developers build you a system to put those pieces in. Clean, encapsulated content and then version it. And versioning is super important. Seems like a big deal, but it's really not. Super important. Versions of your content. We'll let the interface decide what should go where. Think long and hard about how you deal with your content. Good luck to you all moving forward, and uh, let's get ready for the future. Mm -hmm.